Okay, everybody, thanks so much for coming out today. We have a really special guest in the building, good friend of mine for many years. This guy has been named um, one of the top 40 under 40, very prestigious list, built a PR firm from scratch, now one of the um, top 10 PR firms in America. And that's just some of his accolades. Please welcome to the stage this week's power move maker, Mr. Ron Tarosian. Ron, thanks so much for coming out to LIU Brooklyn. I'm glad to have you in the building. Um, it took a season to get you here, but I appreciate you taking the time for us. I love to see you, and I, I'm very happy to be with you. Ron, I don't know where to start, because you have so many accolades. I've watched you grow this company from scratch, um, so there's so many places I can go with it. But I guess I'll ask, before you even got into to PR, what were you doing? Before I got into PR, what was I doing? So I graduated college with no clue what I wanted to do. Uh -huh. Um, and I think I just happened into PR backs and I thought I wanted to work in politics. Um, but I realized very quickly, you know, very few people who work in politics are good people. I think you idealize things and then when you get to know somebody, it's a much different story. It's like when we talk about celebrities, which we'll get into, it's a much different thing to hear their music than to get to know them. It's also much different to watch people on TV than to get to know them in a similar sense. And, um... So I started 5W after working for a few different PR firms at the age of 28. Yeah. What did you major in in school? Political science and English. So you jump into 5W PR. Did you have a background? I know you were into politics, but that's, a, that's kind of a huge leap. I went to work for a uh, small PR firm, which was about 35, 40 people or so. It was my first kind of real... After graduating college, I worked for a year and a half at the pizzeria okay. in the Bronx. Okay. I worked from the age of 11 until the age of 24, delivering pizza in the Bronx. Or no on way. A bike in the Bronx or on foot. I worked 40, 50, 60 hours a week in high school at the Bronx pizzeria. When I graduated college, you got to think my, my mother was thrilled with me working at a pizzeria in the Bronx. You can imagine how, how well that went over with my mother. Correct. Um, and so I worked in a pizzeria in the Bronx for like a year and a half after graduating college. And I loved it. Why did I love it? Because I was hanging out all day long. I went to work at noon. I would leave work at 11 o'clock. I'd go out until 3 in the morning. I wouldn't have to be back at the pizzeria until like noon. I was getting paid all cash. And, you know, I was probably making six, seven, eight hundred dollars $800 a week cash. And I would say to my friends who had, quote, unquote, real jobs, I'm making more money than you. I'm making cash. And, you know, it was fun and I'm hanging out. Um, long story short is um, I worked for two different PR firms. One was like 35 people. And I remember... You know, they would get in at like 8.30, and I said I would be the, you know, that quintessential, I'll be the first one in and the last one out. I would the first one in and the last one out day after day after day. And then I remember saying to myself, well, I think I really like this. And then at one point, I wanted to work on a beauty brand. To this day, I'm 45 years old. I've never spent more than like $12 on, when I used to have hair <laughs> or anything else. I don't know anything about beauty. But I remember I wanted to work on something really feminine and that I didn't know anything about. Why? Because I wanted to prove to myself that I could really do this thing. So somehow I finagled my way onto a uh, Clinique account. There was a, uh, we launched, I launched um, Happy by Men, which was a Clinique brand. I don't know if it's still Now, around. is this still when you're working I was for working small, for somebody okay. else. Mm -hmm. Working for a small agency. Mm -hmm. And then I got bored there pretty quickly. And then um, I went to work for a larger agency, which was owned by uh, IPG. I worked there for about three years or so. And then I decided I want to go out and start my own firm, and I tried to get a few clients. Stop there for a second. When did you know it was time to take a leap of faith and bet on yourself? Because that's always, and many people who are going to watch this, many people who are in the audience today, they're entrepreneurs at heart. They're success seekers. But one of the greatest things that holds people back is fear. They fear to take that leap of faith. They, fear, they, they have that fear of betting on themselves. What made you decide, okay, I've worked in the PR industry now for all of four years. I'm going to jump out the window and take a 
gamble on me. I'm talking about fear. Who says I'm still not afraid? <laughs> I'm still afraid. I got, you know, 45,000 square feet and a few hundred employees. Who says I'm still not afraid? I'm still afraid. I still, you know, I pinch myself and say, wow, is this real? Um, still a boy from the Bronx, went to public school. I'm still, you know, in my mind, still that boy from the Bronx. I'm still scared. What made me do it? I've never been really good at following rules. Mm -hmm. I've always gotten into trouble. I never did really well at school. Um, I just felt that I had to do it. I remember growing up without much money, and I said to myself, I'm going to be rich. I need to become wealthy. My, I do not want my children to want for financial things. So those were, frankly, my motivators. Mm -hmm. Um, those were my biggest motivators, but I felt like if you don't do it young, it's a lot harder to do. Look, you think about life now, you know, when you're in your 30s, I'm now in my 40s. I wish I was in my 30s, but I'm in my 40s. But to do things as you get older, it gets a lot harder, right? You come with, Absolutely. You know, it comes with responsibilities of, you know, as I say to people who are single, I wish you a wife or a husband or children or happy, good things in your life. But the thing that comes with those things is more responsibilities, more bills, and the, the inability to see, you know, I say to a 20 year old now, 20 years old, you can do anything in the world. You can not go home for a week and really nobody's Absolutely. gonna yell at you. Why you can not? go home at 25, nobody's gonna yell at you all day long. You know, at our age, we got kids, mm -hmm. we got responsibilities, we got mortgages, we got this, we got right. that. So I knew I had to do it young, because I knew as I got older, it'd be a lot harder to do. Mm -hmm. And um, I started 5W, I was 28. And yeah, I was terrified, but I'm 45 now and I'm still terrified, <laughs> so it's okay. And that's, and that's good for anybody to know, because the, the fear never really goes away. You know, once you have it, there's a fear of losing it and going back to the beginning. So I totally understand that. You keep bringing up the Bronx, and I love that. I'm from the Bronx, you're from the Bronx. Who was Ron as a child? Were you curious, inquisitive, calculating? Because when I think of a PR person, you have to have a certain personality for that. Who are you as a child? Who was I as a child? Um, raised by a single mother who was my hero, passed away a few years, passed away in 2014. Sorry single, single mother, Penny Wago was my hero, raised me. I wouldn't be the man I am if not for my mom, I could tell you that. You know, people ask about heroes and mentors and role models. I had all of those things in my mother. Um, definitely a wise ass in school. I was a great athlete. I was a great basketball player. You know, like any other teenage boy, I was interested in two things. You want to take a guess what they were? Sports and women. <laughs> that was the extent of my interest at the age of, you know, 13, 12, 13, 14, 15. That was the extent, you know, if it didn't involve, you know, women, girls, women, or, or, or a ball, it didn't interest me at all. Um, I wouldn't have had a clue what PR was. Uh, I wouldn't have had a clue what I wanted to do for a living. Um, so who was I? I was probably somebody who got into trouble. I was a leader. Um, I was assertive. Um, I was a lot of things. I think, you know, I moved very, very, very fast, very, very, very aggressive. Um, and I remember growing up without money and vowing that I would have money. I remember vowing so clearly that, um, you know, my children would not want for anything. But, you know, I have a lot of the future, too, about the Bronx. I, I, I remember in ninth grade, junior high school, 141 in the Bronx, was one of the last few days of school. And I was a real wise ass, but there was a real asshole teacher who said something about, you know, graduation for ninth grade is at some hall in Lehman College. Mm -hmm. you no, know, it's just like finding this, it's like finding this building at LIU Brooklyn. Like, you gotta ask three people to find this room, right? <laughs> so I remember I said to the teacher, I don't know where that room is, you know, at Lehman College. I said, where is that room? She says, you know, if you don't know, you're really gonna be nothing in your life. You should go become a gym teacher. Oh, wow. And I said, you should go fuck yourself. <laughs> Hold on, you were in ninth grade? I was in ninth grade. And I remember, they threw me out, they sent me to the principal's office, something like that. And so I have to call my mother. So they dragged my mother to school at like 7.30 the next day. And my mother says, what'd you do? And I told her. And she says, you were right. And I remember she told the principal the same thing. Good and we left, and we left, and we left, and we left. And we left, and if I could do it again, I would do it again. Good and for I her. raised my children today with the same thing. You know, authority is only okay if authority is the right side. This woman is telling a 13-year-old kid, you're not going to be something because you can't find a building in Lehman College. By the way, I had trouble finding this room here today <laughs> at the age of 45. <laughs> so, and I bet you a bunch of you did too, right? <laughs> and so if your 14-year-old can't find this room today, they're not going to be a loser. 
Exactly. And so I remember this, you know, defining moment. So I thought growing up in the Bronx was the greatest thing in the world. You know, I went to Stuyvesant High School. Mm -hmm. It was a big fight at my house. I did not want to go to Stuyvesant High School. Um, I wanted to go to John F. Kennedy, which was a few blocks away, which was two blocks from my house. And um, my mother, because, you know, why did I want to go to Kennedy? It was two blocks from my house. All my friends went to Kennedy. Why would I want to go? It was an hour and a half on the train at that point from 230th and Broadway to 14th and 1st. You had to take the one train from 231st and Broadway to 14th and Broadway, and then the L train across. It's an hour and 20 minutes in the 80s and 90s of the Bronx riding a subway. That's not a pleasant no, experience. not at all. That's not, not a all. pleasant experience. You know, we had Derek Ferguson as a guest. Uh, he was a style a few years before me. Okay, I was wondering, did you ever see him walking around the hall? Now, the, I know him from Bad Boy from years later. Mm-hmm. But he was a few years older than me. Okay, but he always calls me, you know, yes, he's a Stuyvesant guy. Yeah, Derek is a, Derek's a Stuyvesant guy, but Derek's a few years older than me. Um, but, you know, you try to take a train an hour and 20 minutes from the Bronx to get to Stuyvesant. You know, no 14-year-old kid wants to be doing that in the 80s. This, Absolutely this is, you know, not. I started 1988 or 89 until like 92. To Stuyvesant. Who wants to do that? And by the way, Manhattan for me was like a foreign country. I don't have any friends in Manhattan. All, all my friends are from you know, from where I grew up. Yeah, absolutely. And um, so my mother convinced, my mother didn't convince me, my mother forced me to go. She said, you do not have a choice. You are going there for the first semester. And if you hate it, you can come back. Mm -hmm. And um, I went and I actually liked it because I I, I finessed my schedule. So I would be back in the neighborhood by three or four o'clock. And most days I would end up, you know, where all my Kennedy friends were anyway. And... um, Going to Manhattan at the age of 14, 15 from the Bronx was like another world for me. And it was so great. You know, in retrospect, it was a great eye opener for me. And I learned a lot, you know, and you, um, I think, you know, it, it enabled me to, op- to, 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 to widen my parameter and to widen my view. And um, long answer to a short question. But I guess, you know, who I, was I as a kid? I think I was intense. I think I was aggressive. I was a wise ass. I was a leader. I was never good at rules, which is why I probably started my own company. Yeah, and I was about to say, all of those qualities on the outside might seem like they're not the right qualities for working for someone. They are absolutely golden when being an entrepreneur. I mean, I don't, you know, back then, you know, kids were not on what they used to call it, so like special ed. They would literally put me in the corner with the special ed kids. But then they had to remove me from the corner with the special ed kids because I would get those kids to start too much trouble. <laughs> so they would sit me by myself because I couldn't sit still. And so I was ADD. And so I would disrupt the rest of the class. My grades were good, but I was disruptive. And no, your grades this- had to be good. If you're in Stuyvesant, you had a, you know, yeah, your my grades GPA were-, were pretty good. No, but Stuyvesant is a one-time test. Stuyvesant is just about a test. Got you. You take a test one time for two and a half hours, and either you get it three hours, either you get it or you don't. Um, but in school, I was always in trouble. So they would sit me, they would move me around. And so I'd have to sit with, like, literally, I don't know what they, I don't know what they were called back then, but I think it was special ed. And then they would make me not sit with the special ed kids because I would get them riled up. I would get them to yeah, that's start no trouble good, with the schools. Yeah. And so, uh, but I was bored and couldn't sit still. Um, well, you did pretty good for yourself, nonetheless. I, and, and I no, just noticed you're, you're, you're rocking a Blackberry, and not just any old Blackberry, but probably I've second generation Blackberry. Blackberry. What are you doing? <laughs> I've never given up my BlackBerry. I love my BlackBerry. Love it. So, you know, again, if you would say to me, you know, who did I want to be? I had no clue who I wanted to be. Mm-hmm. Had no idea. I knew I wanted to be successful. I knew I was willing to outwork anybody. Let's fast forward. You're working. You do a stint at a couple of smaller boutique PR co- agencies. For anyone who's watching this, I know it seems like a very elementary question, but what's a publicist? Sure. So, you know, for me, I define PR as a mix of lawyering, being a lawyer, being a psychologist, and being a journalist. It's about telling a story. Mm -hmm. PR people today, public relations today, we're essentially storytellers. And the story might be told to the New York Times or Fox News. It might be told on digital media, social media, Instagram, whatever else. But PR people get hired to tell, to tell a story, to create a story. That's what PR is. When would you say, because everyone, especially when they're trying to get their name out there, they're trying to get more notoriety for their business, everyone says, I need publicity. I need a PR person. When would you recommend that someone actually seek out a publicist? I, mean, I think 
let's back up to that question. I think all of you who have Instagram, anybody who has Instagram, Facebook, Snapchat, LinkedIn, they are already in the publicist business for themselves. Mm -hmm. Everybody has a brand, right? How you dress is part of your brand. How you speak is part of your brand. How you present is part of your brand. You know, I, I wouldn't want to be a kid today because I made a lot of stupid mistakes when I was a kid, and those things would show up on Google today. The world is much different with these, you know, BlackBerry doesn't have it. <laughs> but with these things, we're all publicists. We're all journalists on our own, right? So if I say something here in front of, you know, the audience that's here, that's not just the audience that's here I'm speaking no, you're to. you're talking I'm to the world. to anybody. Yeah. So if I say something wrong and you have it on tape, that's it. Your career is forever changed. And so I think that everybody should be cognizant of public relations, of their brand, of things like that. When we were kids, if you did one stupid thing, it could go away it 10 minutes away. later. Sure. Here it doesn't go away. You know, you talk about you do something dumb, your world is forever changed. And I think everybody should always be cognizant of public relations, of their brand, of their image, for themselves and for a company. Well, you talk about people being cognizant of their own image, their own brand. You have a really, like, what's your job? You walk a fine line because people come into your office and they expect, get me out there, I want publicity, I want the world to know me. How do you navigate between your strategy and what you think is best for a client versus their own vision? Because you know you've worked with people who are, you know, they see themselves a certain way. But you know what's real and you know what you can, that story that you can tell that would best make sense for the public. Whatever you're doing, it has to be authentic and real in order to really work. Um, I think when you're asking about, you know, you can't always convince people that they are something different than they think they are. Um, and sometimes that works and sometimes it doesn't. You know, I think that our job is to make sure that we build a brand which is authentic of, which is representative of authenticity, of reality, of real growth, and of, you know, of really being who that person or brand is. How old is your company now? I started in 2003, 17 years old. So, wow, congratulations. I was looking earlier before I came, and I just emailed you an hour ago. <laughs> our first email was in 2000. Our first email yeah. I can find was in 2003. So the same year you started your company. Yeah, you know, wow. um, Bad Boy was my first real client. Okay, we're going to get to that. Hold that, that thought for a second. What, when you started your, your company, everybody who is an entrepreneur, they come into the space and they have a vision for what they want their company to one day become. What was your vision for 5WPR then, and what is it now? So, you know, because we're on tape, I got to give you a politically correct <laughs> answer. So the reality is, when I started 5WPR, there was kind of two really omnipresent figures in New York publicity. There was Howard Rubenstein, mm -hmm. who at the time for me was like ancient 60, 65, and there was Dan Clores, who was really old. He was like 40, 45. And I said, there's nobody out there who's young. These guys were 45 and like 65 or 70. I want to be number three to them. Okay, these are like New York icons. And at the time, I don't know, Rubenstein was probably 200 people, Clores was 100, I don't know. And I said, that's who I want to be. I want to be number three to those two New York City icons. And um, that was really my goal at the time. I said, how do I build a really aggressive, no BS, alpha male focused PR agency? When people think of publicists, they don't think of alpha males generally. No, no. I think I've helped to change that in New York. You know, people don't meet me and think I'm a, uh, people meet me and understand what I'm about. Um, and I think that when I started the agency, that's really what it was about. It was about delivering no BS results, not being, you know, when people think of publicists at the time, it was Kim Cattrall. You remember the woman from Sex and the City was yep. a publicist? Partying all day. And, you know, being fabulous and glamorous. I'm not fabulous or glamorous, sorry <laughs> to tell you. Um, so I think that's what it was about then. I think, you know, today, 2020, we're a much different company. We represent Fortune 100 companies. I have two co-presidents of the companies. We represent hedge funds and, you know, really prominent people and governments and, you know, and others. And I think today it's about being a really hardworking, resourceful, results-oriented, no BS agency. I think that that's true. But I think that companies, a lot like people, change. I'm happy that I'm not the man. At, I'm happy today, you know, sitting with you February 2020 at the age of 45, I'm not the man that I was when we met mm -hmm. 17, 18 years ago. 
And I hope 17, 18 years from now, I won't be the same man that I am today. I hope to be a better, stronger, you know, man. I think companies are the same. I think 5W, when I started, it was really aggressive and out there and wow, it was a boy from the Bronx trying to prove something. We're good now. Uh -huh. We're good now. Has it exceeded your expectations or did you always know one day you'd be sitting in this seat? We're just getting started. You know, people, well, ask, I love it. Pe I love pe people it. ask me that yeah. and I'll genuinely tell you, you know, it's like the Biggie song, right? My first day, is it Jay-Z or Biggie? One of them has a song, My First Day. And you talk about, you have to approach every single day like you're an intern. For me, I still approach every single day at 5W like it's a startup company. Asterisk, there are smarter people at the company today who run the company who don't allow me every day to be a startup. Mm -hmm. Ron can run like a startup. I don't have anything on my schedule for a week from now, two weeks from now. It's really hard for me to plan that out. Mm -hmm. Even booking this, we booked it a few days ago. Yeah. When you want to book out eight weeks, it's still hard still for me difficult. to do that. Mm -hmm. For me, for my company, that's not always the best thing. So I've learned as I've gotten older to put smart people around me who are not always ADD, not always OCD, and are really planning things way out in advance and structured and process oriented. And those are necessary things. So we say that it exceed my expectations. We're just getting started. And I genuinely say to you, 17 years later, 5W for me is very much a startup company. 5W for me with you know 200 employees and amazing great clients for me is really just getting started. And so no, I'm not satisfied. I'm happy, life is great. So I won't say I'm not happy, but I'm not satisfied even remotely with where we are. Um, you know, we are on a plan to double in size every five years. Mm -hmm. I would have said that every five years we double in size. Last year we grew, this year we'll grow. I need to grow constantly. Who was your first, not your first client, but your first whale? What was that big one? What was the one that allowed you to get bigger office, hire a bigger team? My first real big consumer win was in 2004 was Evian Water. I remember I got the call like um, Christmas Eve, it was literally Christmas, December 24th, two, three, four o'clock. So you're only in business a year at this point. I'm in business a year. Okay. It was Christmas Eve, that'd be three, four o'clock. And um, the phone rings and you know, the guy says this, I remember, the guy says this is Ray Crockett from Coca-Cola. You know, I want to talk to you about, you know, do impossible work for Coca-Cola. I said, wow, okay, great. How can I help you, sir? Um, at the time, Evian, it might still be, Evian was a product distributed by Coca-Cola. So Coca-Cola handled all marketing for our Evian water. He said, we've heard about you. I can't tell you from who, but we're going to be in New York next week and we're meeting a small group of agencies. We'd like to meet you for Evian water. I said, wow, awesome. That's insane. How big is your company at this point? 10 people, 15 people. Really? 10, 15 people. It was, it was Christmas Eve 2004. We were two, year, two years, probably about 10, 15 people. So that's the, that's the whale. That's the first one. That Evian was the to... first, oh my goodness, client. I mean, there was others that you know about. Well, of course. But in terms of a consumer brand, Evian was the first whale. I think they were about... 300,000 a year, I want to say. It was about 25,000 a month. Um, and it was Evian Water. In other words, you know, I don't need to explain to anybody in the room. You know, anybody knows what Evian Water is. Huge client. Huge client, marquee brand. And I remember I went into the pitch, and they're talking to me about, there was a French guy, and the, this guy who was you know, a senior executive in marketing at Coca-Cola, keeps talking about how Evian's a luxury brand, Evian's a luxury brand, Evian's fine French, fine this, fine that. <laughs> And I said to him, I cut him off. And I said to him, I'm a New Yorker, the only place I ever see Evian is in Dwayne Reed next to toilet paper. Can I stop you there? Because it brings me back to a question I asked you earlier. Clients always walk in the office and they have their own vision for what their brand represents. And you have to sometimes give the reality and come up with a strategy that meets them in the middle. I was with, I'm telling you, I was with one other person and they give me this whole presentation. Evian's a luxury, fine, French, authentic, wonderful European brand. And I remember I cut the guy off 
There was like six people in the room. And I said, I live in New York City. I only see your brand in Dwayne Reed. I don't know what it was at that point. Mm -hmm. Next to toilet paper and tampons. That's a luxury <laughs> brand. <laughs> Half of them laughed. I remember a few of them like, gave me dirty looks like, who are you to say this? I won that business when I said that. Because nobody else was saying to them, Evian, again, at that, Evian now looks like this, but Evian at that point 15 years ago was really, you know, again, it was, it was like great Poupon. You know, yeah, yeah. it was like, wow. <laughs> and when I said to them, and then they gave me this whole long answer about how, well, our distribution is screwed up. We want to be in fine restaurants, but we're actually in pharmacies because, and I said, again, I repeated it. That was it. I won the business at that point. Nothing else mattered because nobody else was telling them that. There was a very aggressive CMO who hired us. The guy had balls. The guy wanted to take chances, a great CEO, and they really wanted to make Evian grow. Evian was my largest client for five, six years. Probably was a million-dollar account for five, six years and um, was a great client. At the time, they were the largest sponsor of the U.S. Open. Um, they allowed us to touch celebrities. They allowed us to touch a lot of different things. But I would tell you, in retrospect, Evian was probably my biggest wow client. And it's so funny. Now I'll say it. I hated Evian water. <laughs> I drink a lot of water. And so I used to keep Poland Spring on my desk, but I would always rip off the labels and pour it into Evian, <laughs> and pour it into Evian bottles. And, um, but I wouldn't let non-Evian brands really into my office. And so I used to pour it, I, and I hated the taste of it. I still hate the taste of it. But back then, I remember, I, I, I said to my wife, to my ex-wife, my wife at the time, we only got to buy Evian water at home. And after like three days, I was like, nah, change that. <laughs> <laughs> this leads to an important question because somebody's going to watch this and they want to win business. You took a major risk by being truthful by telling heads of industry the truth about their brand. Would you recommend that for people who are watching this and are trying to win business and they, they might need that client to come on board, but they're too afraid to say what they really feel because that could be the difference between going out of business or hiring a couple more um I think you got to know I think you have to know who you are. I think I know who I am. I knew who I was then and I know who I am now. And I think that I knew that I wasn't going to win a fine this boy from the Bronx wasn't going to win a fine European brand. That's was it. I was not going to I didn't vacation in the south of France like the other PR firms that when they were growing up their parents took them my, my kids are growing up in the south of France. My kids go to the south of France every summer. My kids Today, when they go pitch some fancy brand in 10, 20 years, they'll know what they're talking about from their authenticity. Real, they're going to private schools in Manhattan. They're going up much differently than I did. Absolutely. Okay? And I'm happy that they are. And I hope my grandkids will grow up even better than my kids. But I knew that I couldn't win. I, I, my, my strength at that point was in being authentic, real, and hardworking. And in retrospect, there was a really hungry CEO there who wanted to take chances. Those people, the CEO and the CMO, hired me because they saw I was different than the fold. And by the way, the initial contract was something like six weeks. It was a six-week gig with Evian. It wasn't, hey, be our agency of record. And turned into five, six years. It turned into six years, I think. And I survived two CEO changes. But that was a six-week gig that I got. And so, by the way, you know, people think, you know, that was the moment. Yeah, that wise-ass comment was helpful. But that wise-ass comment didn't keep the client for six years. That wise-ass comment opens the door. It opens the ability to have the opportunity. So do I think that people should tell the truth? Yeah, but I think you also have to be prepared for the consequences. In other words, you know, I remember many things in childhood getting thrown out of classes and doing this and doing that, but I was prepared for the consequences. I knew that my mother would tell me after I told the teacher that, that it was okay. If other parents wouldn't, the child has to think of, what are the consequences in my home? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so I think everybody has to have the ability to internalize. It goes back to brands also. You have to internalize who you are. You have to internalize what your strengths are, what you're good at, what you're not good at, and what you're real about. Over the years, you've had some really great clients. I can't name them all, but 
Welch's grape, um, lifestyle condoms, Soda Stream. You've had almost from the beginning, no? We with Soda Stream for a few years now, and mm-hmm. all those. The Welch's is a current client. Lifestyles Condoms is for 12, 13 years a client. L'Oreal. Client. Wendy Williams. For many years, not anymore. You guys have had really big names. Talk to me about the downside of business. Because we all went through 08, 09, 10. What were some of the struggles you faced? How many and hours? And how did you bounce back? How many hours do we have for this? <laughs> Because people only see the good things. They only look at you, you, you have the title, I'm CEO of such and such. This guy must be doing well. They don't see behind the curtain all that it takes to run a business <coughs> and to keep a business afloat. Having a business is like having a child. It is constantly there. It's constantly a responsibility. It's always on you. Um, struggles, there's always struggles. It's terrifying. The first four years in business, I think I worked seven days a week in the office. The first two years, I tell you, I would be in the office at before 7 a.m. I would not get home before 9 p.m. Monday to Friday. Saturdays, I would work 9 to 3. Sometimes I remember I would give myself a light time. I would go to the gym in the morning, and I'd go in from like 1 to 4, 1 to 5 on Sundays. That was my first three years of owning my own business. I went on a three-day honeymoon, no vacations. Literally, the first three years, I worked seven days a week. Literally. That's what it takes Literally. to start the year. That's Literally. what it takes words, to get a business off the Christmas ground. Christmas Eve, 4 o'clock is when that Evian call came in. And I would say to myself, if I wasn't in the office that day, Christmas Eve, that guy might not have left a voicemail. Mm -hmm. By the way, he might have been calling 10 PR firms. That guy at Coke who was making the call was probably just calling down the list. And he had a zillion things to do. He's calling, this guy is calling, you know, Coke is in Atlanta, so it was probably 2 o'clock for him, 3 o'clock for him. Before he goes home, he might be calling down the list of 10 different PR firms. Had I not answered at 4 or 5 o'clock Christmas Eve, I might not have ever gotten that client. And, um... I think of that. So, talk about sacrifice, many, many, many hours of working hard, constant stress, and st- I had no backer, no, you know, nobody, you know, it's constantly terrifying being an entrepreneur. It's constantly terrifying working for yourself. It's constantly a challenge working for yourself. Um, people don't realize the struggle that goes along with it, and it is a constant struggle, and it's it scary. Is. It never is. And it's scary. And being an entrepreneur, you know, it's like I hate... I'll say that on camera. I hate these holidays like President's Day <laughs> and Martin Luther King Day and all these holidays. You know why? Because the mail doesn't come. And guess what does come? Your bills still come. And so Columbus Day and all these other things, I always say as an entrepreneur, and I've gotten better at it through the years, is, you know, all these holidays and strikes and all the rest. You know what the entrepreneur still does? It's like in Goodfellas. Fuck you, pay me. <laughs> right? you, all see, you all see Goodfellas, right? You know when the guy says, fuck you, pay me? Employees are still getting paid. Absolutely. So, you know, tomorrow if there's a snowstorm here, whoever's paying these light bills, they're still paying. So when the mayor goes out and says, well, you should all stay home. You know, my work ethic is like the bodegas in New York City. They work 24 hours a day. 24 hours a day. There's no lock on the door. (laughs) And so that's still my work mentality. That's still my, you know, that's still my DNA in terms of, you know, that's my work ethic. It's like the bodegas in the city, 24 hours a day. I'm a New York City kid, right? These things don't close. And, um, and I think that that's what being an entrepreneur is about it if is. you want to build a successful business. Because you know what? There's no paycheck on the 15th and the 31st for us. You still got to, by the 15th and 31st, you damn well better pay your employees if you want to build a sustainable business. I have never, ever, for years, I've never missed a single, I've never, I'm never late on any bills, ever. Employees have been paid since day one. And, you know, now it's not a big deal. But when I was starting, it was really, really important to me to do that. It was like, you know, you've got to be, you're taking responsibility for people. And I remember when I started to hire people, it was scary. I said, wow, I'm hiring somebody. And like, there was, you know, I remember when my first employee mm-hmm. had a kid. I remember it was 2005. I had an employee who had a child. A few years in. I was like, wow, this guy works for me and he has a kid. <laughs> and he's going home to his wife and saying, like, I'm going to pay for our kid from 5W's bills. It was scary. It's very scary. scary. It's it very scary. scary. You know what else is scary? Being in a service business. Sucks. Really tough. It sucks. 
Really Anybody tough. who's thinking about going to the service business, I'll tell you, go and create a product or something. But service business sucks. It's tough. Really a hard business. For anybody who's in the service business, are there any clients that you would pass on? Are there any clients that you would say, you know what? Somebody costs too much. Keep your money. It's not worth it. So 17 years into business, I'll tell you that some of my biggest mistakes have been working with clients I shouldn't have worked with. Anybody who, you know, I, I tell all my senior executives at 5W Today, one of the most important business books I highly recommend is a business book called The No Asshole Rule. Mm -hmm. If you haven't read The No Asshole Rule, you should read it. Great, great, great business book. It teaches you about being tough and being strong, but not being an asshole, right? And so for many years, I think at 5W, I didn't understand that. Okay, I didn't understand that the client is not always right. Okay, I hate to break it okay, to you. Hold on, can you look in the camera and say that? The client is not always <laughs> right. The customer is not always right. I think the reality is, is that there's a misconception the customer is always right. The customer is not always right. They're just not. And so I won't work with assholes at the simple rule. Assholes, you know, can be broadly defined, but somebody who's always nasty and always difficult I think it took me a while to learn it, but those people are the least likely to pay their bills, are the most likely to be awful to staff, and they're just constantly difficult people. Um, through the years, I've made a mistake of working on certain types of clients that bring a backlash for working for us. Um, I say on camera, I worked for Girls Got Wild for years. If you all remember Joe Francis, Girls Absolutely. Got Wild. Yep. He was a client for years. And I thought at the time when I took him on, I could make him the modern day Hugh Hefner. That was the goal. So you all think about who, 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 who Hugh Hefner was. You know, Hugh Hefner was an icon, right? Hugh Hefner was not a pornography guy. Right. He was a, a, a cultural icon, right? I thought I could make Joe Francis that. Um, the reality is I couldn't for a lot of different reasons I don't want to discuss on camera, but he's not a good guy. Um, I don't want to say a lot more than that, but I'm not a big fan of, uh, of people that are always difficult and... Um, and so again, it's a different of a perception there versus a perception here. They're two different things. Um, and so I made a mistake working on a bunch of clients that I thought would be something different. Mm -hmm. And that's part of the growth process. I recently turned down, in the last 24 months, I don't want to say who, probably the biggest news story in America. And I'm happy I turned it down for a variety of different reasons. But I think you're 17 years in. Everybody knows 5WPR. You're now one of the top 10 PR firms in the USA. You can make that decision now. But for somebody well, I who's would still you, trying to come up. I would say if you're trying to come up, you got to do things differently than you do today. So the, the question is, what's more important, quantity, quality? The most important thing, first of all, is being able to sleep with yourself. The most important person you sleep with is yourself. Okay? You need to be able to live with yourself with the decisions that you make. Mm -hmm. So I have, a, I have a friend who works on something I would never work on, but he's okay with it in my business. I would never work on what this person's working on, but he's okay with working with what he works on, and he generally is. So we say quantity or quality. I don't know if it's quantity or quality. By the way, Prez, there's entrepreneurs out there that are happy waking up at 10 a.m., working until 3 o'clock, and they're happy with that. And they're making whatever they're making in four or five hours a day, and they're lifestyle entrepreneurs, and that works for them. I don't know if I call them entrepreneurs. I call them people who just don't want a boss. That could be. It's, it's a sim, you know. You know <laughs> but 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 in today's I can go world, drive an Uber. I, I I don't know if I qualify as an entrepreneur. You know. There's different definitions of what maybe they're contractors, but there's people that. You're right, don't want a boss for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. And so for them, they're, they're happy not, you know, not having a boss and not needing to go to work in the morning. A lot of it is about what you want, right? A lot of it is about, I'm 45, I don't need to keep going to work a zillion hours a week, a, a week like I do. And it depends on what you want. People who watch this program, people who are sitting in this audience, want to sit in that seat. So I'm what speaking specifically about entrepreneurs who are looking to grow their business scale, one day see themselves on the cover of Forbes magazine. What should they do? What should they do? Work a zillion hours. 
Simple as that. And th no, not as simple as that, but I'll tell you that that's a start. You want a simple, my, my first recommendation, get a work ethic you like know, the You know what? It leads me into the, to my next question, and you're hitting on it right now. What are tips for entrepreneurs trying to acquire new clients? Tips for people who want to succeed and, uh, and um, attain new clients. Number one, if you're just starting, adopt a work ethic like the bodegas in New York City. Do not have a close sign. Your potential client does not care that it's your aunt's birthday, doesn't care that it's your kid's birthday, doesn't care that there's a leak, doesn't care you didn't have an aunt, that you didn't do this or do that. Nobody gives a damn. Nobody cares. Just remember that. Okay? So I would tell you that, number one, work really, really, really hard. Number two is understand who you are and who you're not. Okay? If you're working from your basement, you're not likely to get McDonald's as your first client. But you might get the hamburger joint down the block because the guy really likes you. And you'll get a chance with them, right? I would tell you to understand who you are and who you're not, right? Um, I think that those are two initial tips. And I'll give you, you know, believe in yourself. And believing in yourself is really, really, really important. It's from your core. Mm -hmm. It's not announcing, I believe in myself. Do you really believe that you have it? Do you really believe at your core that you can make it? I can look you in the face today and tell you, my business is going to keep growing. Period. Period. Five years from now, if we're sitting here, I am a complete failure if my business isn't 20, 30, 50, 75% bigger than it is. But you know what it won't be? It won't be 500 times larger than it is now. You know why? Because I like to sleep in my bed. Because I like to go to the gym in my house every morning. Because it's really important to me to make up with my daughters half the my, I'm divorced, my kids are with me half the week. It's really important to me to make up with my daughters half the week. And you know what that means? I can't grow my business 500%. You know why? I'm not willing to be on a plane every single day to a different city. Will that change in 5, 10, 15 years as my daughters get older? Yes, because I'll be more willing to do it. You know what that means? I understand who I am. I cannot win business right now in Africa and Europe and Australia. You know why? Because I want to wake up with my daughters half the week. And because I like to wake up in my bed. And you know what that means? I can pretend I'm the best PR firm in Africa and Australia and Europe, but I'm not. You know why? Because somebody else will go to those places every day. Because there's somebody like me that says, I don't need to wake up with my kids every day. I don't care about sleeping in my bed every day. There's people in my business that are on the road 25 days a month. I don't want to do that. And so that means I understand who I am. I understand what I can do and what I can't do. It's also why my business, I think, has grown, because I now have people in the business who are able to go after business that I don't think I would win. They'd never let me today tell Evian, your business sucks, you sold <laughs> extra tampons. I'd never be able to do that anymore. Talk to me. You're in the PR business, which essentially means you're working around the clock. You could have a client that a scandal breaks out 4 in the morning and you gotta get to work, phone call comes in. As a person that shapes the narrative, when do you decide that it's right for a client? And we see so often in the news, every day, stars are coming under fire. When do you decide, make a statement, or just shut up, and it'll go away? I think it really depends on who they are. I think it's really hard for celebrities to shut up. I think it's really hard for well-known brands to generally shut up once it becomes a really, really, really big story. You know, that book, The Tipping Point, if you haven't read, you know, Absolutely. of course, a great marketing book. The Tipping Point is a great book. Go read it if you haven't. But The Tipping Point is an important narrative. In other words, how big is the story that you need to respond, that you need to comment, is something you need to understand. So I think when people talk about, you know, crisis, what constitutes a crisis is really important. So, you know, I got a name drop here. I, I, I lectured last year at Harvard Business School on crisis PR. And, you talk and, about and, and now you're at LIU Brooklyn. <laughs> now I'm in LIU Brooklyn. <laughs> but, but last year I lectured to a bunch of classes on um, crisis PR at Harvard Business School. Mm -hmm. And I get to, and there was a narrative about, there was a case about United Airlines when they dragged that doctor off the plane by his face. Do you remember mm -hmm. that story? Yep. You know why that wasn't really a crisis for United? Because they're very short op. It was a very. It, it didn't materially fix the, affect their business. Something like 55 people, percent of people said they would never fly United again. But guess what? 
out of 98% of the cities in America, you don't have a choice. And how many of you now who are flying, what you're doing, tomorrow you need to be in Washington, tomorrow you need to be in California. You know what you all are checking? What's the price and what's the departure? And that's it. Because it's not that you have 75 different choices. You have three choices. And that's in New York City. Pretend you're in Baltimore, there's one airline. Pretend you're in a hub of United, I don't know what United hubs are. So that was a short-term crisis. That was not a fundamental crisis. You talk about fundamental crisis, you know, the coronavirus now. That's a fundamental crisis for the, for the country of China, for tourism, for cruise lines. That's not a road bump, right? That is fundamentally affecting the gross national. Anybody here going to travel to China anytime soon? No. So no. you better believe that tourism, if you own a hotel in China right now, you're terrified. Okay, let's say you're talking huge. Um, Dominican Republic the, the, last year, the, those murders. You remember the, yep. all those people killed you know, at Dominican Republic? Those, those are fundamental, humongous, humongous, humongous crises. T talk to me specifically about scandal, right? Not crisis, scandals. Say Matt Lowers, your client. He doesn't make a statement. But by not making a statement, it's almost like he made a statement. His career plummeted. It's over for him. Um, nobody survived the Me Too movement, and that's another discussion that we Except can have. Except for your president. And when you look, and let's say you are advising a Trump. Has he completely changed what PR has become? Because his thing is deny, 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 and it seems to work. President Trump like him or not, is a master at public relations. Make no mistake, when you talk about defining the narrative, this is a person that has completely, he is not an A-plus in PR, he is an A-plus, plus, plus, plus. Number one, he's reshaped the whole concept of media. He doesn't need media. He does not need anybody. You know why? He says something on Twitter and everybody follows. For years I've said, I wrote a book in 2011, you can all go For and get For immediate release. For immediate release. You can go get the book, it was written in 2011. I said, if I have a big superstar, I'm not giving an exclusive to anybody. Because I can go out and say whatever I want, whenever I want, and I don't need Fox or CNN or the New York Times because they're all going to run whatever they say. And Trump realizes that. Mm -hmm. President Trump is a master at shaping and reshaping narratives, shaping and reshaping stories. But I want to stay focused in terms of when does somebody respond? It has, to be a, it has to be a fundamental big story for a big brand to respond. Um, you know, and sometimes you don't. You know, when you talk about... I have a, uh, you know, I think there's varieties of times when you can respond and there's times when can you can't Can I ask respond. you specific? I might not answer. You can okay. ask. <laughs> Fair enough. If you represented Gail King, she does a, an interview and as a journalist, she asks a question that many found to be offensive about Kobe Bryant and his legacy and the rape accusations that he had 10, 20 years ago, whatever. How does she reply? What would you have? It wasn't just, you know, that wasn't about Gail King's statement. That was about Gail King's statement followed by Snoop Dogg and others making comments about Gail King's statement. So what would you tell Therefore, Gail? Gail King had to Gail King had to respond. Gail King had no choice, I believe, but to respond. Um, because it wasn't just that Gail King said something. It was Gail King said something and then Snoop Dogg and others said A, B, C, and D. She had to respond. She had no choice because she lost control of the narrative. And, and as a prominent black journalist, she can't lose support of a big constituency. So it's not just about, you know, people crowing and crying. You have an important constituency to her who has to, you have to play, you have to answer them. You have to play to them. You can't ignore this community that's so much a part of who you are. One more question for you, and then we'll move on. Speaking of African-American constituency, we now have our former mayor of New York, Michael Bloomberg is jumping in his presidential race. But <coughs> while he was mayor of New York, he instituted the stop and frisk program. Now he wants to be the president of the United States and it's coming back to haunt him. What would be your recommendation to him? Tough. You know, <laughs> the problem, you know, You're the again, master, Ron. Again, what these guys, Bloomberg, Trump, others, you know, it's completely changed. You got a camera everywhere you go. And both Bloomberg and Trump are zillionaires who didn't become famous overnight. It's not like, you know, Bernie Sanders. Nobody knows anything about Bernie Sanders except he's a politician, mm -hmm. right? He's been a politician for 20 years. Obama was nobody before he was a, before he was a senator. He wasn't a, 
Bloomberg and Trump have been well-known people for forever. They've had yeah. cameras on them forever. Um, I think it's tough. I think that this presidential race is, um, I think the presidential race is very tough, it's very difficult, no matter who runs against whom. It's difficult. But you're not answering the question. <laughs> on purpose. <laughs> <laughs> you know, okay, let's go back to... <laughs> one of the things I learned, you know, is you don't have to answer the question that you're asked. You answer the question you want to, a- you answer the question you don't want to answer. A true PR man. Take it back to business for a second. How many employees does 5WPR have now? We have about 200 employees. Oh, congratulations. And we're just getting started. Congratulations. Just starting. Okay. In business, you have to have great people. And this is just a business question for so many people out there who are trying to scale a business. People give great interviews. But you hire them and they don't live up to that interview. What is your hiring process? And how do you retain great talent? So for a long time, I did the interviews. And I think um, today, thankfully, I don't do them. We've become a much better company because of it. I think the hiring process just has to be about a culture fit. Um, For a long time before we hired somebody, I would have a meal with them. Mm -hmm. I think it's one thing to sit in the office. It's another thing to I would make them meet me like at a diner. And I just want to sit and see, you know, how you order coffee, how you speak, how you're this, how you're that. Um, I want to see how you interact with people. Again, you talk about the service business. You have to have the ability to speak to somebody. You have to have the ability to interact with people. So I, I like to see how that, you know, how that played out. So I would always do a meal with somebody next to my office, like the coffee shop on the corner I would do for a long time. Um, you just have to ask questions and have them, you know, ask questions and be prepared um, but I'll also tell you that one of the most important business lessons I got was from Mark Echo. Mark Echo once told me years ago, when I started my business, fire quickly. If somebody's a mistake, fire quickly. You're doing yourself and them a favor. And I've learned that and I've applied that. Um, again, today at 5W, thankfully, I don't do the hiring or the firing. Um, because there's people a lot better than me at it. Um, but I think that um, the hiring process is really difficult. I think for entrepreneurs looking to build businesses, you just got to learn to understand your gut. I think, you know, I believe entrepreneurs are smart, but there's smarter people out there than most entrepreneurs, right? Agreed. I was, I'm, again, I spoke at Harvard, awesome. I would never have gotten into Harvard. And I think <laughs> most entrepreneurs, most great entrepreneurs don't go to places like Harvard or like Columbia or UPenn. You know, there's plenty of great people that come out of LIU Brooklyn, but the people who come out of a school like this are not likely to be top of the class They have to understand their gut. You have to understand where you come from and what you're good at. And I think that that's one of the keys to being a good hirer and employer. Finding best in class talent for you, what matters most? Values, abilities, skills, or reliability? For my top people, I would say the top people at 5W, first of all, they're good people. Okay. They're good people. That really matters. Good people. I think hustle always matters at our company. Somebody will not succeed at 5W who wants to work 9 to 6. Just won't work. Right, Bobby? <laughs> <I'm> <laughs> play here. But if you work 9 to 6 at 5W, you're not going to succeed at my company. If you're somebody that needs constant feedback or micromanagement, you're not going to succeed at our company. You know, for me, I care about hustle. I care about attitude. I care about the desire to win. Those things really matter to me. And winning is a lot different than not losing. You gotta play. I tell people, don't be afraid to take, to take chances and to make mistakes. But if you make a mistake, own up to it, accept it, live with it. Um, so I think you know, what matters most to me, hustle matters, attitude matters, energy matters. Um, but I would hire a valedictorian of LIU. Of, I would hire a valedictorian of a smaller state school mm-hmm. than I would have an Ivy League. For me, for our DNA in terms of who we are. I want to congratulate you um, on a couple of things. Number one, since I've known you, you have had some people that's been with the company forever. And I read uh, not too long ago a press release that Matt, um, K- am I saying his name Matt right? Kayla, yeah. Mike, Matt Kayla, yeah. Matt Kayla and... Um, Dara Bush. Dara Bush. They share the presidency now. How long were each with the company? 
So I named two co-presidents of 5WPR um, in January 2020. Mm-hmm. Um, Matt Kills And Matt's a, Matt's a rock star. He's, he's a great guy. Matt works for 5W. So I have two pro-presidents. I'll tell you a quick story about the president, the guy who dialed the president of 5W. Mm-hmm. He showed up 15 minutes late for his first interview. What are you talking about, Matt? Matt showed up for his first <laughs> interview with me 15 minutes late. And I told him, what the fuck? You're 15 minutes late. What the fuck is wrong with you? I gave him five minutes. I said, if you want the job, I loved him in five minutes. So if you want the job, come back tomorrow at 5.30 or I'm not hiring you. And I literally, the guy, he's like, the train broke down to this. I said, I don't give a shit what happened. The train broke down to this. And so I told him, I'm not hiring you. You got to come back the next day. And I gave him like five minutes in the interview. He showed up 15, 20 minutes late for the interview. Um, today, I probably wouldn't have even seen him. And I usually won't see people. In other words, if you're 15 minutes late for the interview, 99% of the time, I won't see you. So I saw him, and I made him come back the next day. He gave me some whole story. And he's now with me probably, I think, 11, 12 years. Dara's probably five or six years. Um, and so I'm happy that we named co-presidents of 5W. They're much smarter than me at many different things. And it allows the company to continue to grow. And I think entrepreneurs are good at some things, and executives are good at other things. Um, and I think it's about understanding your strengths. And again, at the age of 45, I'm able to say I'm not the best at everything. I wouldn't have said that years ago. And I still have a very healthy ego. Don't get it mistaken. <laughs> but I think you have to understand what you're really good at, what you're not good at. And so, yeah, I keep people for many, many, many years. Our average vice president is with us about eight years. Our average SVP, I think, is with us about seven years. And that's really, you know, for a relatively young company, a really long time. We have a lot of people who leave and come back. Um, we create a great work environment where people can win, where people can grow, where people can take chances where people can do fun things. Those are important things to me. Would you consider yourself a loyal guy to your staff? I would consider myself tremendously loyal to my people. What's more important, loyalty or performance? What's more important, your arm or your leg? I mean, <laughs> I mean, you know, they're both really important. They are both really important, both but you really can be important. loyal to a fault. You can be loyal. I mean, if you're loyal and dumb, do I want you to work for me? No. <laughs> I mean, you know, if you're loyal and incompetent, do I want you to work for me? No. And I think I'll also tell you that like I said earlier, people and companies evolve. People also need to evolve with where they are and who they are as a professional. So there are people that worked for me for years that I've gone to them and I've said, we're no longer the right company for you. I've gone to people and said, you really want to do X? I'm going to get you a job in another company. I'm going to get you a job with doing something else. Where do you want to work? I'm going to help you get that job. What recommendation do I need to give you? Because there comes a point where... Again, for me, if you want to be a top executive for us and you're content with where you are, I can tell you a story. I remember probably 2008, I don't know, I'm going to get myself in trouble if I get too specific, but I had an employee who would walk around and say he's really successful, he's really rich. I'm not really successful and really rich today, okay? I'm just getting started and we're going to keep growing. If I hear a senior executive who says he's really rich, how hard are you going to work if you're really rich and successful? Mm-hmm. The guy works for me at this point. How hard are you going to work? And so if you think, if you're thrilled with where you are today and you work at 5W, you're not right for us. You have to always want more. I love you know, that. One of the I models at 5W constantly is I want you to take your boss's job. Your boss is going to keep moving up, but I want you to take your boss's job. People who succeed at 5W have an attitude of they're going to go out and do it, and they're going to go out and create. And ask for an apology, don't ask for, ask, ask for forgiveness, not for permission. And so you have to continue to exceed expectations because that's what clients expect and that's what we expect. And I want you to expect it from yourself. More importantly, what I want is what do you want? If you work at 5W, you want to be great. I want you to want to be great. And my job as an entrepreneur, as a CEO, is to help you to be great, is to reward you to be, for being great and, um, and to set up systems whereby you're going to win. And so loyalty is important, but you got to be loyal and good, loyal and smart. And performance, yeah, performance is more important. It is more important. Good. Performance is more important. Uh, <laughs> um, speaking about being great, you guys won in 2018 PR Agency of the Year. Can you explain to everybody who's in the room and who's watching, what are the Stevies? Because you guys swept it that year, no? Stevies are the American Business Awards. They've been called like the Emmys of the business community. Thankfully, we win a lot of awards, um, and they're nice, and they're good for recruitment. What really makes me happy is that we do great work for clients. 
I can't sleep well at night if people pay us and we don't do great work. It's really important to me to do great work and to be a great employer and to allow people the chance to do great work for clients and to really constantly win. Awards are nice. Mm -hmm. What's more important to me than awards, frankly, is doing great, great, great work. I got to do great work for clients. That's what motivates me. That's what motivates my people. Um, that's really the truth. Awards are really nice and they're good and they sound good, but the reality is I think awards are won in business by getting to the office every single day and plugging ahead and moving forward and just doing great work. That's the truth. Has that helped more business walk in the door sure. and better talent walk in the door? Helps for talent and helps for business. Nice. What advice would you give? Because there are a lot of people who have started boutique agencies. Um, there are a lot of people who want to get into PR. You are a success story. You're still young, you're healthy. What advice would you give to someone who wants to start their own boutique agency? If you want to start a boutique PR firm, first mm -hmm. you should go out and get a few clients. Make sure you have clients. You know, a dollar in a dream works, but you got to make that dream work. Do you have a client? Is somebody willing to pay you for what you do? That's the hardest part. The hardest part is getting the clients. You have to have somebody actually pay you. So you, before you're going off to start an agency, who's hiring you for this agency? Do you have clients who are actually going to pay you? The ability to do great work, <coughs> there's two things. Can you sell and can you do great work? So to build a business, you have to sell and you have to do the work. It's both things. And so I would tell you my advice if somebody wants to start a boutique PR firm, make sure you have clients and make sure you can do the work. And make sure you can go a few months without taking money. You know, it's not overnight that you're going to, you know, there's no, I, I don't believe in quote unquote overnight success. I think, you know, overnight success is day after day after day grinding and working and trying and pushing and hustling. And those are really important things. I think it's really important to understand that if you want to build a business, you have to have clients and do great work. Again, for somebody who's watching this and they want to build their business, I think so many entrepreneurs get it confused and maybe you can speak on this. I don't care what business you're in, we're talking PR now, but you really are a salesman. You keep, and I don't know if you guys are catching what he's saying. You at the top, you're not doing day-to-day -day PR. No, I don't work in PR. I mean, you I love are to do, a salesman. I love to do PR, okay, but when you own a business, you do HR, you do finance, you do sales, you do psychology of managing people. Mm -hmm. You're not able, as you build a business, it's funny, you know, people think about that. As you build a business, you do less of the thing you enjoy doing. And you learn, if you're a CEO of a company, you manage many, many, many different things. So it's finance, it's human resources, it's the law, it's paying bills. And there's no textbook which comes for here's how you do it. It's like having a kid, you know. When you have a kid, you get the baby. There's no book that tells no you here's book. how. There's no book that tells you, you know, here's what you do with the baby, right? Same thing with a business. In other words, you, know, you got to trust your instincts, understand your instincts, and make them work for you. And I'm going to come to bring this to a close. But in the world of PR, and you spoke about this briefly, but there's somebody who wants to start up their own boutique agency. They want to start up their own firm. Is there room for success the way it was for you 17 years ago? 17 years ago, there was no social media. YouTube hadn't been invented yet. There was no way for people to get their own story, their own narrative out there. Is there a need for PR firms in 2020? You're asking two different questions. Number one, is there a need for PR firms in 2020? I would tell you there's more than ever before a need for PR firms in 2020 because everybody's walking around with these. Right, there's a zillion influencers, mm -hmm. and meanwhile there's Kim Kardashian that's an influencer. There's two different worlds of what they look like. Yes, there is very much a need for a PR firm. There will always be a need for people to create and craft your stories. Is a PR firm of 2020 the same as a PR firm of 2010? No, different things. So yes, there's a need for a PR firm, question one. Question two is, can somebody succeed in a PR firm today? I hate when people say, well, this guy's number one and this guy's number two, so I can't win. I think anybody, there is always room for growth and success for hungry, smart people. There's always room for another law firm. 
There's always room for another PR firm. There's always room for another college. There's always room. There's Coke and Pepsi, and somebody else can be the next Coke or Pepsi. Are you familiar with Tom Bilyeu, CEO of um, Quest Bars? Yes. He has this quote that I love. He says, there's always room for the best. And it's as simple as that. Absolutely No right. matter what There's business. always room for success. Yep. And, well, well, I can't do it because Facebook is there. Well, there was no Facebook before Mark Zuckerberg created. And guess what? You can be the number five social network and still make a lot of money. And I can't do it because this guy's there, that guy's there, this guy's there. If you're always negative, don't go start a business. You got to take chances. You got to create. And yes, I think there's always opportunity. And I think if somebody started a PR firm and they were good at what they do, they could succeed. What's the best advice you ever received? Best advice I ever received was from my mother, from my mom, Penny Waga. Believe in yourself. Constantly drilled into me that you could do anything and believe in yourself. That's the best advice I ever received. It's the worst advice. Worst advice I ever received. Um, probably that ninth grade teacher who told me I, you know, I should go and become a special ed teacher or some gym teacher or something that she told me. Worst advice I ever received. Um, I don't know. You know, I, I don't want to focus on negativity. I think that there's a lot of people say a lot of dumb things. You got to listen to yourself and listen to your gut. If you can go back 20 years ago, what advice are you giving to 25-year-old Ron Tarosian? I'm saying a 25-year-old Ron Tarosian, a lot of things. I'm saying, number one, you have two ears and one mouth for a reason. You should remember, you should learn to listen. I love that. Learn to listen, I, I would it. say to myself. I would say to myself, you don't always need to run 500 miles an hour. Sometimes it's okay to slow down a little bit. That's probably the two major things I would say to myself. Um, and to learn to smile. As I've gotten older, I've learned to smile a little <laughs> bit more. I think it's hard for people that view themselves as fighters and as underdogs and things like that. I would say to myself, you know, learn to smile. Um, and it's hard when you're building and you're growing and you're, you know, it's hard to smile. And um, I think that I would say that to myself now, too. Give it up for this week's Power Move maker, Mr. Ron Tarosian. Thank you, sir. Thank you. What's up, guys? Thanks for sticking with me to the end of the video. Truly appreciate you. If you like anything you heard here today, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. And if you know anybody that can benefit from this message, feel free to share. Peace and love.